Hello, Trampoline friends, and welcome back to episode nine of Trampoline Insight. I'm Nuno Marino, alongside Stephen Gluckstein, and today we have another special guest, the only Australian to ever make finals at the Olympic Games and medal at the Olympic Games. Here with us today, we have a world champion on double mini trampoline in 1996 and the first ever male to earn a silver medal at the Olympic Games in trampoline in Sydney in 2000. Please help us welcome Jai Wallace. Hello. How you doing, Jai? Thanks it's for lovely joining to be us. celebrated by losing. Oh, by no. losing. <laughs> I was the first loser, though. Oh, nah. uh, yeah. So I don't see, I don't see it that way. And to be no, beaten by Skalenka, it's okay, you know? It's okay. Is that, yeah, exactly. is that really, okay. If he's the only that one really that can losing? beat me on, uh, at the Olympic Games, then uh, I can walk away happy. I would be really happy losing with that one as well. So I cannot say I cannot say any bad things. I think I think it's a great achievement to have. Yes, <laughs> so I think they there absolutely. should have been should have been two competitions: Muscalenko's competition and then the rest of the world. Right? <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that to Dimitri. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Um, Jai, can you tell us how old you were when you started and, and how you kind of got involved in the sport? Yeah, trampoline is a it's really considered a backyard sport here in Australia because back in the 80s and the 90s, it was all about skateboarding and mucking around in the backyard and what, what you could entertain yourself with at home. So I guess a little bit like the crisis at the moment, we were stuck at home and what do you do? And uh, my parents bought me a trampoline when I was about five or six. So in the early 80s. <laughs> uh, uh, just mucking around, and I actually taught myself a back somersault, a backflip on the on the wow. trampoline at home within a couple of days. So my mum kind of went, uh, "Let's send him up to the local PCYC here, so the Police Citizens Youth Club, so kind of like the gym." Uh, yeah. And we went up there, and I just sort of really took off from there. I I I, I loved it. Uh, all the neighbourhood kids were all up there, so we were jumping around, and of course I was kind of naturally good at it. So that always helps when you are when you're a kid to be kind of cool at it. Absolutely. Um, and we it just really ran from there. And did you did you start like in classes or you started competitively right away? Uh, back in again back in the eighties, it was really come in, try, and then try the local interclub competition. You didn't need a leotard, and it was really informal. So again, that was just fun, and I again I did kind of well there. And then Melanie Tonks, who uh, who's uh, who has been around for quite some time, she was a coach at another club in my city, but just on the other side of the city. And she happened to see me at one of these local PCYC events, and she said to my parents, "That kid's got a bit of talent. Uh, why do, would he like to come across and train with us?" And at that stage, Melanie had most of the senior national team, uh, so it was really just a. a, a natural step for me to go there and then from there I just really watched what the bigger guys were doing and I always wanted to do what they were doing so by my second national championships I was starting with Rudy outs and half in half outs and half outs wow. and so uh so even as a little kid I was wanting to be like the big guys that's awesome so would that's, you that's would fast. you consider Melanie your first coach yeah, Melanie is my first, definitely was my first coach. The coach that was at that local PCYC, uh, obviously they introduced me to the sport and, and got me started, but Melanie was definitely my first coach who knew what the jig was, what the game was, how to do trampoline. And I was with Melanie for 10 years before we sort of, we escalated or needed to escalate it uh, up into the sort of the upper echelons of trampoline. So, so, so after that really 10 well. years, at what, what level were you at then and, and, and where did you go? Uh, so I was already ranked 13th in the world at the, Nash, at the wow. World Championships in Sydney. Uh, and in 96, I was already World Champion on Dog Mini. So uh, we done, had done some incredible things together. But even as the sport was changing into an Olympic sport, uh, Melanie knew and was very accommodating knowing that she couldn't take me any further and that the Olympic coach that was brought in by Gymnastics Australia to take over was, uh, was the right decision to be made. So I actually moved away from home. Uh, we 
chucked all my stuff in my car and drove to my friend's house and parked my car in the garage and I slept in the garage for a couple of weeks. Uh, and how we old were you at that the, time? Uh, uh, 23. No, 22. No, 21. 21. <laughs> <laughs> it's a while ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, at that point, the uh, Gymnastics Australia, was that Nikolai that, they, that you were working with that they had hired? Yeah, that was Nikolai. So the way that all worked was uh, at the beginning of the training for the Olympic Games or the, the program, there was five of us in the program. There was three uh, athletes in Melbourne, one athlete just north of Sydney and myself in Brisbane. And make, to make it fair, it was Nikolai's time needed to be divided up into all of us. So one week each. So every five weeks I would get Nikolai. And I said, well, that's not going to get me anywhere. What? And nobody else was prepared to move. And at that stage, there was a real, no, there was a bit of a, a competitive environment, let me say, between the southern states and the northern states. So yeah. I sort of stayed together with the northern states. So there were two of us. I moved to north of Sydney. So there were two of us there and there were three of us in Melbourne. So at least that way, I got two weeks out of every five. But because wow. I did that, they said, okay, you've made that. Uh, that sacrifice will actually take you to Melbourne for a week, 10 days while Nikolai's in Melbourne. So we actually got a whole lot more because I was prepared to move. Wow. But st even still, how, I mean, how long was it like that for with two weeks on three weeks off? That was, year. that was a year until the world championships in 1999, which was the single qualifying event for the Sydney games. Right. So back then it was just that one. You had to hit it. You had to yep. quit it. So, uh, so luckily, I uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was that one event in 99 that you had to do really well at and I yeah. did very well. So all of a sudden everything was sort of changed around to where I was. So Nikolai moved to where I was and then everybody else sort of had to move around that. So I know this question wasn't planned, but I just remember it. So the qualification for, for, for uh, Sydney 2000 in, in Australia. So did you get the spot in 1999? Yeah, so I qualified. And that was a, 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 a nominative spot, or was that a country a country spot? Because I believe I think I believe at the time it was a nominative spot, right? I don't remember very well. Yeah, so back in '99, it was a named spot. So if you qualified, it was your spot. Uh, and at the World Championships in '99, I placed fifth. So if we took uh, there were two Russians wow. and then anybody else. So actually, I moved up into fourth qualifying spot. Uh, but if you took myself out of it, Adrian was the next athlete, but he was actually into the nominated spot where the uh, Oceania hadn't qualified, so they actually got a spot. And because Australia right. hosted the Games, we got a spot anyway. So Adrian would have fallen into that, but I qualified in fourth. So it was a clear outright my place to, to have. How do, you, how do you feel about the, the, the way it is now, that it's not nominative and and that after you earn a spot for the country, you have to go back in some countries, you know, some countries will give it to you. And, you know, some countries you have to go through a, a rural trial system. How do you feel about that? I don't, I don't mind as long as the rules are set in stone well in advance and everybody right. knows what they are. You know, some yep. people that's going to play to, other people that's going to be disproportionate against. But as long as everybody knows what the rules are, then that's what you play for. So, and that's what we played for back then. We played for an individual spot. If we got that spot, that was ours. And that really came down to, a, it was quite controversial here in Australia because the girls place, they placed 12th. So they got the spot. Robin got the spot. It was her spot as 12th. But if Robin didn't get the spot, the next spot that that would go to would be another Australian who was right behind her. And then, of course, it became quite controversial even more because over the next 12 months, the two top Australians, both boys and girls, were sent around the world or to the World Cups to make sure that they were hot and ready for the Olympics. The person that uh, Robin beat just beat Robin at every other competition. Oh, no. Wow. It was very, it actually went to the sport of arbitration. They took it that far. Wow. So Robin's Olympic experience was very, very different to mine. Well, I thought wow. that was just in the US as to, that those things would happen. Uh, no. And I, I, I kind of understand that that might have happened because it was so, 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 like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And back then, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 were just that. It was so, yes, right. so close. close. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, so, if, if you want that spot, you're going to fight for it. 
so so with that with that qualification that you 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 get the spot how did things change with with Nikolai's time in Australia you were getting there before why don't you continue on continue on that story how, how much more time did you get out of Nikolai and and how was your training regiment at that, that time so before the 99 world championships Nikolai was living in Melbourne and cuz that's where the majority of the athletes were there were three athletes down there versus two in Sydney uh, after the Olympic, uh, after the Olympic qualifier, uh, Nikolai moved to where I was. Okay. So it really did make make a big shift towards where the athlete with the most chance uh, would be. So Nikolai came to us. So I had him full time. That means the other athlete that was with me, Jackie, she had him full time, and the Melbourne athletes moved in and out. Nikolai would also go down to Melbourne, but we would travel with him. We would go with Correct. him so it was trying to make it as fair as possible um and of course being in australia we had all the opportunity to make sure that we did this well so not to say funds were unending but we were well funded to make sure awesome. that we had every opportunity to do really well and how how was your your training uh regimen like with melanie and then with nikolai how many hours were you training a day a week yeah, yeah. So this side, what I was training before Nikolai, <laughs> and this side is what I was training <laughs> after Nikolai. Absolutely poles <laughs> apart. Poles apart. And it was, it was a culture shock to us to have Nikolai come in because we would always see things from afar at World Championships or maybe a World Cup. We would see what you know, the Europeans or the Russians or those guys were doing. Um, they would also look at us with <laughs> disdain and go, what are they doing so so professional athletes? So before, before all, of, all of the things changed for us, uh, we were training three, maybe four times a week. Uh, and for warm-ups, so I was you, playing squash or playing you, computer games. You and became Nick, a world Nick, champion. You became a world champion on double mini training three or four days a week? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know how many people probably hate you right now after learning that? That we're please, training. Please, please don't hate me. Trust me, Nikolai made up for it. <laughs> Nikolai made up for it. So, Fair before, enough. Before, before the Olympic, before everything changed, we paid for everything. We paid to train. We paid to, for access to competition. We paid for We paid for everything. So that's what we could afford. And when we used to travel to world championships, back then it was every two years. So we were paying for that trip. So yeah, we used to travel afterwards. After the Portuguese world championships, we spent another month in Europe and we went to Egypt and we, we traveled around nice. because we paid for that. After, after the, everything's kind of paid for. So it's such a business now where you're in and you're out and you're home and you're training again. So before, yeah, before the, uh, before the Olympic qualification, it was three or four times a week. Uh, double mini was maybe, maybe an hour of each of those times. In between goes on the trampoline, we weren't stretching or doing uh, exercises. We were playing squash or playing pinball or you know, mucking around. And Melanie used to scream at us when it was our turn to get off the squash court and you know, come <laughs> jump. We used to do a routine and then get off and go do something else again. Uh, but then, of course, once it all changed, it was very, very different. And as I said before, it wasn't just a culture shock for us to have Nikolai come in. It was definitely a culture shock for Nikolai to come in <laughs> way. And you know, everything that that man wanted us to do from his heart, what he knew, we said, what? No. Come on. Are you kidding? It was, a, it was a tough, tough time for him. Uh, but I spoke to Nikolai a couple of years ago and he said the best time of his uh, memories of being in Australia was, was that time that we trained for the Olympics together. That's yeah, awesome. And how, and you, you, you alluded that it was, it was tough. How many hours did Nikolai have you training and how many days a week? Right. So we went from six hours a week, which was, as I said, kind of training. We'd do a routine and go play squash to six days a week. <laughs> you know, it was, Physio and Cairo and um, obviously all the gym work that we used to do. And because I'm naturally a slightly larger person than Dong Dong, you know, for me to keep my weight down is really, really hard. Since the Olympics, I'm 20 kilos heavier. 
um, than my 68 kilos than I was at the Olympic Games. So for me to keep my weight down, it was food restrictions and long runs and you know lots of unhappy training sessions because I was so tired. And I used to ride my bike 15 kilometers to training just to keep my weight down to get my wall and ride all the way home again. Oh all gosh. of those sort of things that come into it that you don't yeah. really realize when you're training six hours a week to mm. training six days a week and anywhere up to you know, 24, 25, 26 hours a week. It's a, it, was a, it was definitely a mind shake up. But obviously it worked. You know, it took you to, to new levels of success, right? Of course. And I think that's where my experience is slightly different to the other athletes that were in the program because – once I understood where Nikolai was coming from, I said, okay, what he will tell me, I will do. I still moaned and groaned and bitched about it, but I did it. You know, where the other athletes sort of snuck around the corner and didn't necessarily do it 100% or made it really difficult for him. And as I said, I moaned and groaned too, but I knew that he had his uh, goal in mind for me and I was, I was on board, I was sold. Awesome. So whether it's with Nikolai or before with Melanie, as you were training, did you have any idols and did those idols change um, through your career? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, everybody had the idol of Moskalenka, right? Uh, his yeah. <laughs> final routine at the Portugal World Championships in 94. I wore that tape out watching that. Yep. I yeah, me too. It. Rewind, watched it again. Rewind, watched it again. It was it was the hottest routine. And even no no uh, no, I'm not dismissing anybody that's jumping now, but nobody for me, what I've seen has been able to match what that was. That was just that was pure class, I and uh, and it was something that I wanted to emulate. You know, we we were taught you know uh, spot to twist, not global twisting or anything. So for me to be able right. to see what he was doing and repeat, 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 watch it again was such a shift in my technique. And then having Nikolai come over the top of it and improve that technique again was uh, was something that was always I was in always in awe of. I would agree so, with you, so and I think I think everyone. Can, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, so you can you can put a. Um, a a period on, on something that has been discussed on the internet lately. So we did an episode about doing all, all four events and how many events in the world could do all four events. And your name pop up as doing all four events at the 1994 yeah. World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, like I said before, we used to muck around on all the apparatus and, and muck around in the gym and play squat and do everything. So there was a tumbling floor and it's not an air track. And it wasn't a rod floor and it wasn't a ski floor. It was fibro with <laughs> cut tennis balls. We used to cut tennis balls in half and stick them on the floor. And we used oh, to no. tumble that with a blue mat down it. And then we thought, oh, why don't we double that up? So there used to be two floors on top of each other and roll the mat down there. And that's the way we trained for such a long time. Um, so did but, you compete? You know, tumbling was fun for me. Tumbling was really fun for me. So did you compete 1994 tumbling double mini individual and synchro? Not 94, 96. 96. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. See, that's something that, okay. 1996, Canada, Vancouver, yeah. you did all four events. Okay. So yeah. when did you stop doing all four events? Was, was, was that the only time that you did all four events? At the at World Championships, yes. Because up until then, things didn't align. And after that, things didn't align either. But 96 was kind of where I really hit my straps. And in 95, there was a World Cup in Canada, in Vancouver, and they did a sort of a World Cup trial as a double mini event. And I, and I won that one as well. So that was kind of my step into having other athletes around the world know who I was. And then in 96, I did really well. Uh, and then I got invited to the World, Cup, uh, World Cups after that in Europe. So that was a real turning point for me where people understood who I was and what I wanted to achieve and what I wanted to participate in uh, and almost what legacy I wanted to leave because everybody kind of wants to leave a legacy, right? Everybody wants to be known for something. So, uh, so I'm really happy that I did really well then. But then obviously my focus wanted to change. I wanted to change focus after that because trampoline was where it was heading and we all 
sort of had in the back of our minds that that would be the sport. If ever a sport of ours was to be accepted at the Olympic Games, it would be individual trampoline. That's that's wild that that your your mindset shifted that way because I think there's a lot of people in, in today's competition that are good at trampoline and good at double mini and they have some success at double mini and then they take off and, and decide this is my route you know right. because uh but then i guess this was a turning point too that the the olympics were coming out for trampoline so that's kind of a uh a shiny dangly keys at the end of the road that you don't want to you don't want to miss out on right about it it was the be all and end all for me especially for me my my mum tells me the story that even from three years of, of age watching the moscow olympics in 1980 i was transfixed and i can remember the dancing bear at the opening ceremony and i can remember the gymnastics and i can remember the swimming and i can remember some things in the in athletics so from three years of age, the Olympics and big major sporting uh, events have always had my attention. I remember wagging school. Wagging school means skipping school. I remember wagging school when the Commonwealth Games were on. You know, I used to pretend I was going to school and then my parents would leave the house and I'd run back and I'd sit there all day and I'd just watch what was going on at the Commonwealth Games. And then when my parents come home, I'd hide under the bed. So then they'd come home and then they'd make me out in the backyard and I'd pop out and go, hi, I'm home from school. But I'd been at home all day watching, watching this, uh, not the Olympic Games, the Commonwealth Games. So right. it's always something that I wanted to do. And as I said before, when I understood what Nikolai wanted for me and believed that I could do, uh, I was sold. So as soon as the Olympic Games, that dangling carrot was there, I was in. Right. And of course, right. being at home in Australia, I mean, who can, who can forget that? I mean, right. debut sport at home at the Olympic Games in my backyard. Right. What a time to be alive. For, you know, Seriously. Well, so how many world championships did you compete in, at least for, for trampoline? Uh, so 92, 94, 96, 98. And then I came back, yeah. So for 2005, 2006, 2007, so eight. Wow. Did you, did you cut 99? Uh, oh, 99, so nine, there you go. Right, because 99 wow. was, was, the, was the, the... Well, that's when it all changed, right? That's when it went to... Yeah. Uh, every, yeah. So before that, it was every two years. So we would only see our international uh, fr friends every two years. It was crazy back then. So out of right. those, out of those uh, nine world championships, how, how, many were you, how many times were you world champion in double mix? Just one. Just one? 1990s. Any day, Nuno. Thanks. Oh, I agree. I agree. Don't get me wrong. You know that being world champion in double mini was always my goal, and I never got it. I was very, very close. So that's right. But so it was 1996, and was it was it that the one that you tied with Chris Mitrick? Yeah. So technically, um, I have to share that with Chris. I know. It's okay. I, I would share that. Chris is a great yeah, guy, so I would too, share that right. with him any day too. So. <laughs> and did you did you set a, a a record a difficulty record in '96 as well? No, '98. '98. Yeah, truth mount, half truth mount, dismount. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yeah. On on the the ten centimeters by ten centimeters yeah. double minis. Smaller yeah. double minis. Yes. Smaller. A little bit like my tumbling story, where we used to tumble on the worst possible equipment. Uh, you know, the guys now are doing truth mount quad back on much better equipment than we ever could have imagined. So back then, but oh yeah, we come from, in Australia, we come from a long line of very competent world champion athletes on double mini. So out, yeah. out, of, out of all those achievements, because you have plenty of achievements, what, which one are you the most proud of? Well, of course, the Olympic Games. I mean, as I said before, um, coming second to Moskalenko is a, is a win. You know, oh, I agree. Uh, at, at home, first time at the Olympic Games, debuting our sport to the world. And the gymnastics community had no idea what hit them. The year before, the gymnastic administration came to our national championships. And back in the 80s and the 90s, our national championships and the world championships used to party like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, the gymnastic administration never do that, or they don't understand that. So they saw us as <laughs> our boys. 
<laughs> uh, so then for them, for them to have us come in and almost steal their spotlight in Australia, that there's a trampolinist for the first time, <laughs> comes in, wins a medal, makes the gymnastic crowd go bonkers, like they've never, ever seen that before. Because most of the people in the crowd there, you have to remember that obviously the Olympics are so popular that only a certain amount of tickets are available. So all the popular sports everybody wants to go to and the less popular sports, they kind of get given tickets. So of course, nobody knew who tra what trampoline was. So most of the people in that crowd were given tickets because they never got the swimming or the athletics or the tickets that they wanted to. So they were just there to enjoy the Olympic Games. So the fact that this little Aussie fella that nobody <laughs> had ever heard of in a sport that nobody had ever heard of was in the gold medal position. <laughs> Until the last, Until the jumper. last guy jumped. Yeah. The last guy. My name is still in the first position. Until one more. Just, so the crowd is going absolutely nuts. 15,000 people. We'd never jumped in front of a crowd like that before. So we didn't know what was going on. And you could see me <laughs> in my yellow outfit waving at the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. And so many people have said that that was, they were in the crowd and they said that the, that was the, one of the nights of their life. And I used to say to them, was it one of the nights of your life? Can you imagine what that was like for me and for everybody uh, that was involved in such a long journey to get there? It was such a special moment and such a great debut for our sport. Absolutely. So, so, did, so did, that, did that medal come as a surprise to you? Or, or when you went to those Olympic Games, you had a medal in mind? Or well, you course, thought, you, yeah, the medal, the medal is pretty hard. I, to be a finalist, I would be pretty happy. What, what was your game plan? Yeah, no, we were training for gold. We absolutely have to train for gold. If you want to win, you've got to train like you're going to win. So that's what we were doing. We were putting in the extra, we were training three times a day. I said to Nikolai, let's train three times a day. If we can train three times, why not? Let's do that. I remember one time, yeah, Nikolai used to butt heads quite often. Uh, and he, he did talk to me for a week. But I was there in the gym training every day, even though it wasn't giving me the program, wasn't giving wow. me any feedback, wasn't doing anything, completely ignoring me. But he was uh, there. There'd been an issue before that. Um, but yeah, at the end of that week, he came over and said, you've been here all week. I respect that. Let's go. So He was just like we, in the corner, we, we like watching out of the corner of his eye. <laughs> oh, well, of Like course. giving you... <laughs> Giving you the silent treatment. <laughs> he's there and he wants to talk, but he's not saying anything. Oh, 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 Too cool. Of course, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we were training for gold. You, ha you have to train for gold. And remember, I placed fifth at the World Championships and was in fourth place. Uh, so the medals were right there. So I right would there. Not, to, not to believe that that was possible. So can you share some of your fondest memories from the Olympics, like um, being in the village or the days leading up? How were training stressful or, you know, enjoyable? What, what was your Olympic experience like, aside from, obviously, your, your routine and the, and the medal? So leading into that, yeah, I've been known to have a cheeky beer every now and again. But going into the Olympic Games, I thought, right, from New Year's until the Olympics, I'm not going to drink. I'm going to take this seriously, absolutely seriously. So, yeah, I was living with a couple of mates at the time, and they were party boys. So I used to go to a party and then leave by 8 o'clock. I'd be going, are you kidding? I'm out of here. Uh, so I'd go home and just sit on the couch and just hang out by myself. So I had <laughs> such a long time, but I was getting crankier and crankier. And training was getting worse and worse and I was more frustrated and it was just getting to the point of I wasn't competing very well. Uh, I did kind of well at nationals, but I didn't win that nationals that July before September. So at nationals, my mate, my housemate said to me, have a beer, relax, yeah. have a beer, take the pressure off. And I did. I had a couple of beers and all of a sudden you can see in my training diary, you can even see the way I've written, you know, the structure of my lettering and my numbers. It just looks happier. You can actually see from the beginning of the, the year, it just gets angrier and angrier and shorter and terser. And then it just so just being a little bit more true to myself allowed the, the whole experience to open up into a positive experience rather than trying to be somebody or do something that I wasn't. So getting to the Olympic Games, I was really happy that I went through that because I'm able to impart that knowledge to somebody else. Be yourself, be yourself, do what you normally do 
be smart about it, but do what you normally do because that's how you're going to be a success. So that's one of the, uh, the happy things. And then, of course, obviously, after the Olympic Games, going into the Olympic Games, we knew that it was 16 days. Trampoline was day eight. So we had to make sure that we were on top of it, you know, eating well, sleeping well, training well, all of those sort of things for the eight days until competition. And then it was kind of like a free fall. You could do whatever you want after your right. competition. But, of course, I did well. So after doing well, you are pulled from here to there, from TV to radio to pictures to other, all of a sudden people know who you are. They want to speak to you. They want to get pictures from you. So that was an absolutely nut bag of a time. The first eight days were traditional Olympics, serious. You've got a job to do. Don't let, put your blinkers on. Don't let anything else get in the way. After that was uh, an explosion of color. I got to the closing ceremony. I didn't go out partying after the closing ceremony. I got home, laid in the shower, in a warm shower, and I woke up an hour later. I was that exhausted <laughs> wow. from all the craziness oh. that had gone on after that. Did you, so um, this is for me. Did you go through to, into the opening ceremonies as well or just the, the closing? Yeah, we did go to the opening ceremony. Normally what happens is uh, the people that don't go to the opening ceremony, they're either competing the next day or within the first right. two or three days. Yeah, because it is taxing people. You don't realize that it you're is walking so, for hours. It's all day. You know, you've got to be there at you know, four, three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon. You're sitting around waiting and then it takes forever to get in. So it is quite exhausting. So I understand if you're there the first two or three days, it's a shame because the opening ceremony is so special. And of course, again, being at home in Australia, it was going to be mind blowing whether we did well or not. So it was just crazy. Um, so that opening, so we absolutely were into the opening ceremony. And then after, before that, I didn't go to another event. I didn't see another event. After that, I went to anything and everything that people gave me tickets to. That's awesome. That sounds like a good time. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't. Really I can't imagine fun. having the Olympic Games in 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 my home country. That I mean, that must be fantastic. How would was it? Did it? Did you feel the pressure that you were the the home home country when you were training or competing? I I don't remember feeling the pressure either to do well or the pressure of the gymnastic community or the trampoline community or the sports. Team. I don't remember feeling the. I'm sure it was there. But I think I was so focused on the job at hand that I didn't let that sway me at all. Uh, so the pressure wasn't there. I knew what I wanted to do. Nikolai believed in me. I believed in the road that he had taken me down. So we were really confident with the plan we'd set in place. So the pressure wasn't there. I think I felt more pressure at national championships because there was almost an expectation right. you, to, to win. And on yourself, because what does it look like if I don't win and I'm you know, ranked highly in the world, but I, don't, I can't win nationals or I don't win nationals or you're mm -hmm. um, the first time that you're going for a, a national championships win and you, you know that you're then you've only got one routine or one pass to go. You know, that pressure, I certainly remember that pressure. But at the Olympics, I don't remember it being like that. I think I was having too much fun. <laughs> yeah. So, and so I think did you have, did you have any, any mental preparation for the Olympic Games? Did you have... Help of a psychologist, or, or, or was it just Nikolai? Was it just the competition yeah, it, like you prepared yourself for world championships? It, it, it was Nikolai. It was Nikolai and myself, plus the extended team. But, uh, but it was a very intimate relationship that we knew what we wanted to do. And Nikolai has all the experience. Yeah? Nikolai coming out of the Eastern Bloc, he had all the experience that was necessary. Uh, and he's got the results to back it up, you know. He's one of the premier coaches of the world. So for him to be in my corner, I had complete faith in what he was doing. As I said, we butted heads quite often because, you know, in Australia, part of the process. Have, what? What have, how many times a week? <laughs> right there. We live by the beach. I want to go to the beach. If, so, if, if an athlete doesn't butt heads with his coach, then something is wrong there. Yeah, <laughs> I think Absolutely. so. So, so what is, so what is the most number of optional routines that you've ever done in a training? Do you remember? Ten. Well, ten. complete 10 attempts, probably about 30. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> but you had to do 10, 10 routines. Yeah. 10 full routines. Yeah. So if you got to number nine, yeah, that didn't count. Right. So yeah, there yeah, were many days where we'd be in there three hours, four hours yelling and screaming at each other. Taking a breath yeah. outside, 
coming back in. I mean, there were plenty of days where Nicola, I didn't talk to Nicola and Nicola didn't talk to me. There were plenty of days like that. Um, but yeah, 10 routines, 10 sets, 10 volts back then. Yeah. I remember that clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what, a, what, a, what else in training? Did you always only train routines or did you, got, did you train skills and fun skills that you maybe didn't have any intentions of putting in a routine, but just for fun? Uh, probably before Nikolai. Not while I was training with Nikolai. Everything that we trained with Nikolai was very focused and had a purpose. Uh, before, you know, we used to muck around with all sorts of skills. Some of the fun skills that I remember doing with Nikolai was full, full, half and full, full, full. That was always nice. fun, you know. In a full, tuck or full, a puck position? Full, 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 full half pike. Wow. That, Whoa. That, was fun to do. that was fun to do. I didn't do anything so ever you... off, but, uh, but full, full half pike, full front half pike. That were really fun. That's awesome. Wow. And I know one of the things that I remember, because um, I used to compete one and three, and I always wanted to compete my one and three like you. So with that first long stretch, and it's such a yep. signature to you, you know, no one else in the world does it. No one else has done it. So is that something that you kind of created or is that something Nikolai told you to do? How did that come about? Yeah, that was, that was a Nikolai invention. He was always coming up with things like that. I mean, remember Ekaterina with her three quarter back by Cody, you know, there was a stretch in there as well that was unique and unusual. And mm -hmm. that's what you've got to do with trampoline. And it's probably especially now because there are so many good athletes and the uh, code of points is so limited that you've got to do something unique and special to stand out. And probably that's what we had back then too, because I was sitting in fourth place, qualifying fourth. So I had to stand out against David Martin, Dimitri Polyrouche and Moskalenko. You know, how did I break through to make sure that the judges remembered who I was? So Nikolai came up with that. But something that I made sure that I did was that, that when I jumped onto the trampoline to get ready, I stood on the edge of the trampoline and I smiled. I looked every judge in the eye and I <laughs> smiled. So hopefully that they would remember that when they were going to take points. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a little different now, though. I might disagree with you because back then it was who you are, what's your name, what leotard are you wearing, what country are you from? And nowadays, there's the majority of your score is taken from an objective uh, perspective, whether it's difficulty, time of flight, horizontal displacement. Half of your score is pretty much taken from a machine, you know? So those oh, scores cool. now, yeah, back then, a difference wow. between 8.8 eight and 8.5, you know, you're in finals or not. And that person didn't have to justify their 8.8 eight or 8.5. They just went... That was a two. No, that skill was like three tenths deduction, and you know it's perfectly justifiable. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we're living in a different time. Right? That that transition from old school trampoline into Olympic standard trampoline. Every sport goes through that. That's not just a trampoline only mm -hmm. thing. Every sport goes through that level of professionalism because it has to. It has to. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's money involved. There's sponsorship involved. There's you know, there's qualifications involved. There's the, the law. There's the law that gets involved now too. So the, it has to go through that transition. But you're right. Back back in the 80s and 90s, it was, and you know, not to say that the people that were getting good scores didn't deserve it, but there was absolutely uh, cases, there was cases where you know people from certain countries got good scores because they were from that country. And there right. Was no doubt. Oh, I remember so, that. Yeah. So the fact, <laughs> the fact, the fact that you, you know, thrived in that, it speaks volume, you know, even more so than, than, than it is, is today. And, um, that's interesting that you say that because once you said that I was Nikolai's idea, I started having flashbacks to like Ben Wilden and Scott doing brandy straight to stomachs and back fulls to stomach and starting their, their first routine with all of these different weird skills. And, you know, and obviously it worked because 15 years later, Remember. I still remember it yeah, pretty vividly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and remember, we're, we're looking, it's, a, it's an aesthetic-based sport, so it's what you see. So if what you see is new and unusual and different, you're going to remember that. Yeah, that's true. So doing these full, full halves and full front halves and full, full fulls, did you ever have any um, mental issues with your skills or blocks or confusions? Not with those skills, you know, it's funny, the bigger the skill, the almost, 
and the raw of the skill, the, the better I was. I had awful trouble with Rudy's. <laughs> I don't think you're alone, man. I think there's a, I think there's a, a majority of the world that, that hates Rudy's. And I think the last – I almost stopped doing Rudy's pretty much um, after they were required – after they finished being a requirement. I think the only time I did Rudy's was when my coach absolutely made me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, there was a good year there where I would stop in a compulsive routine because the Rudy was there or I'd crash out of it or – yeah, there was a lot of a lot of frustration built around that one particular and skill. It was it was a requirement, right? Yeah, back then, yeah, one and a half twisting feet to feet skill. Yeah. So you could have done so, back one and a half. A bit more creative. <laughs> Nikolai would make you right. <laughs> so how how did the, the the problem with the Rudy transition to Rudy out and then Randy out? Because you do a Randy out at the at the, at the routine at the Olympic Games. How did that how did that transition went? Uh, it was probably because of that trouble. So I found a way to make it work for me. Rather than continuing to try and bash my head against that brick wall, I tried to find a way around it that still uh, met the standard. So it was much easier for me to do that because I, as I said before, I was, a, I was taught to uh, spot, twist and wrap. And there was no global twisting. There was none of that sort of stuff back in the 80s when I was learning those things. So for me to try and transition into that was very difficult for my headspace. So I found ways around it to make it work for how I was particularly jumping. And I wasn't a great, I wasn't flexible at all. I'm still not a flexible person. So for me to get my arms up, to get my shoulders up, all of those sort of things was, was quite hard. Um, because I never did it as a younger, I never stretched before in my life before Nikolai. Um, so, <laughs> so to be a 20 year old, uh, being told to know, know how to do the split or for him to be jumping on my back, pulling my arms <laughs> up above my head was actually really, really hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> for tip of the week, people. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so you, until you're 20. For me to get, get those skills in I definitely had to find that way around it but then it ended up being okay you ended up doing your Rudy's and, and Rudy outs and it was just a difficult time was there yeah, anything I, that you can like attest to helping you I give just m my desire to make it work mm -hmm. uh, I didn't give up I, I wasn't ever known for giving up if something didn't work I'd try a different way to get you know to get through I didn't stop Nothing ever stopped me. Even as a little kid, um, Melanie would always say that I was the only one that was always asking for more. Can we try this? Can I try that? I used to annoy her no end as a little jumper. Can we do this? Can we do that? I used to always watch the bigger guys. And if they were doing half hours, I wanted to do half hours. If they were doing half hours, I wanted to learn half in, half hours, even though I could do a back somersault. I wanted to do what they were doing all the time. So I always wanted to be better. I never wanted to be average Jai or average Joe. I always wanted to be better. And that's probably what got me to where I was, especially in the earlier days. You know, I was 13 when I was first in the elite open national team. And, uh, and that, that's pretty young for back then. I feel like, I feel like you were destined to be anything but average with a name like Jai. Do you have any other friends named, named Jai? <laughs> Is that common in Australia? Funny, funny story. At the Olympic Games, there was another jumping, obviously jumping Jai, trampoline jumping Jai. There was another Jai, a long jumper named Jai. No. But, but he's J-A-I. Okay. The story oh, okay. gets even funnier. He is a Queenslander from Royal. He's from Brisbane. We went to the same high school. Really? No way. He is four years older than me. And he also won silver at his first Olympic wow. Games. Wow. Wow. That's too so funny. Both Jumping Jai's from Kingston High uh, <laughs> won silver medals at the Sydney Olympic Games. It's crazy. I can, only, I can already see the journalist thinking that you're talking with you and right. you're talking with the other Jai. <laughs> and then the opposite. Right. So, so, so tell us about I your trampoline routine. So what are you up to nowadays, Jai? What are you, uh, what are you, so, what are you working on? Yeah, I'm back home after the Olympics. I wanted to try aerial skiing, so I gave that a crack. Uh, but that sort of, I, I didn't push anywhere near as hard as what I should have. And a few things didn't fall into place, so I went back to trampoline. That's how I got back into trampoline, 2005, six and seven. Uh, then after that, I went to Cirque. 
So I was in Cirque with Macau for quite some, for, for some time, but I fell on teeterboard. After 10 weeks of opening, I fell on teeterboard and smashed my right ankle. And that took I heard me there's, to learn I heard, how to walk in and get better. I heard there's a 100% injury rate on teeterboard. Someone, I forget, <laughs> someone from Cirque du Soleil told me that. There's a 100% injury rate. That may as well be, may as well be. Um, and it was just a simple move too. Yeah, I was trying triple backs, board to board, and full full, yeah, all sorts of stuff on the boards, but it was just a simple straight jump, but it was just happened to be very high. And the other person on the other end, remember Didier, Didier from Switzerland. He was on the other end. Um, <laughs> he, he just didn't jump and all the weight went through my ankle and just smashed my ankle. So I remember getting off the back of the stage on my bum, like a dog with worms, my legs were in the air and I was just trying to get myself off the stage with my foot in the air. Um, as was it during was, a show? Yeah, during the show, Saturday uh, night, final, uh, final act, full house. Wow. Of course. So I, I fall and there was a physio. I, I remember the physio running down the back stairs, Baywatch style, with the board under the arm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the show was going. I remember Nikolai saying, and my circ coach, Misha, saying the show must go on the image must keep going just like on trampoline mm -hmm. you've got to get to 10 skills you've got to keep going so of course that was half the reason why i pushed so hard to make the image keep going uh but of course that yeah i fell uh smashed my ankle the doctors looked at it and went either can physio this out for six weeks or we can do surgery and i went well why would i do why would i not do surgery have six weeks off and then be back ready again but then when they opened it up they you know, they took out cartilage, they took out bone, they reconfigured my foot, all sorts of stuff. So that took 18 months to, to get better. Wow. Uh, and then I found myself in Canada coaching uh, there for a little while. And then I came home uh, and now I have, uh, you know, I've got my husband and my puppy and my mum lives with us and we've got a business. Uh, plus I work for F45 as well. We have a couple of studios at F45. So life is very, very busy. Wow. Nice. That's so awesome. What's, what's your business? What's your business about? You say you have a business? Yeah. So we have a, an aesthetic business. So a skin based business. So it's uh, you know, PRP or you know, the vampire facelift. We're sort of in that realm of aesthetics with cosmetic surgeons and plastic surgeons. We teach them how to use new technologies. Um, so that's really good and, and at the moment we have F45 so we're doing online a lot of online things and we have a lot of the trampolinists in Australia joining a couple of our Zooms a week to keep them fit during this because uh, obviously they don't have access to anything at the moment especially not their own gym so we have three of those and uh, and before this was over I was working with Darren Gillis at Robertson so I was just doing two times a week training uh, training and coaching with uh, some just some very social trampolining that's so awesome. Life, life, nothing, nothing Nikolai style then. <laughs> nothing Nikolai style, but I do find myself repeating a few of his mantras, even to um, the kids <laughs> that are doing it one time a week and for fun. I really haven't <laughs> stopped myself from saying a lot of things that are, are just reverberating in my head the whole time. <laughs> Flashbacks. Welcome to our lives. Flash mm -hmm. Flashbacks. I, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So have you have you kept up with the uh, the sport um, today and and the competitions um, going on now? Have you been able to see kind of what they're doing? So I watch yeah some YouTube footage and things like that. I I, I don't hunt down the uh, results, but I'm definitely uh, aware of what the movements are and some of the ideas, especially here in Australia. I, I keep in contact with obviously Darren and a few of the other coaches and a few other former athletes uh, that are still involved. So my conversation is still there, and I watch who's uh, who's coming up and, and what's news, and of course watch all the majors, so World Championships and Olympic Games. I I, I, I do find that. Mm -hmm. And are you, so, have you heard of the, the, the new code of points that are coming out after the, they're changing the rules? Have you heard about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two optional routines or two no, yep. no compulsory routines. So, uh, and obviously, again, you know, so many, there's so many good people out there now that the things do have to change, whether it turns out to be uh, for the good or not, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it will be a shame to not see, uh, you know, a stretch one and three kind of, kind of thing that will go from from the international stage uh which will be a shame but obviously there's a there's a there's a time and a place for that 
Yeah. So what, Absolutely. what's your gut, what's your gut saying? You, you, would you, if you were jumping today, would you be happy or upset with this change? I think back then that we didn't have so many skills. You know, we weren't mm -hmm. doing five triple routines. You know, the, the top three at the Olympic games, we all did three triple routines and they're the only three triples at that stage. So it was definitely a different time just because we didn't have the skill base to go for two optional routines. Now they do, now they've got the skill base to be able to do that. And of course, these guys that are jumping at the high level now, they don't know any different. So to be able to put myself in their shoes is sort of, so just, just, just to clarify, so the proposal, and it was accepted by the technical community, it will be two routines, but only one count. So they will be able to repeat the same routine if they want to. So it will be, it will be similar to what long jump is and triple jump that have three attempts to, for the best one. Here you'll have two attempts to count the best one. So right. in terms of skills, they actually, they actually need less skills because they only need 10 skills. So I'm curious. I'm curious. And we talked about this before, if we're going to see more triples or if we're going to go into the quads, knowing that some people already try quads in the past, but uh, will we see them more often now? What, what do you think? Right. Well, Daisuke back at the Sydney Olympics, he tried a quad to begin with. Didn't land it very good and actually <laughs> injured himself and he didn't jump at the Olympics. So, but I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure people are doing quads. Yeah, we're doing quad back off double mini. So I can't imagine why we wouldn't be doing you know, quads on tramp. And it adds to the excitement, of course, because the boys and the girls jump so high now. I mean, they're probably jumping a whole body length higher than what we were back then. So they've got the room and also they're training for it. They're training for it and it's, it's something that lots of people say, how do you do that on the trampoline? And it's not like we just jump up there and decide to do it. You're training right. for years and years and years for it. So to be able to see that in it's always spectacular. I mean, that might be cool because we have, everybody knows that double mini and tumbling is so powerful and everybody gets excited about the power behind that. And trampoline is very graceful and lots of things happen high in the air. So to get some power behind a quad will be very exciting. So I have a, I have uh, two, two things that I would like to ask you, just, just how you feel about them. So I, I'll tell you first about me. So when I was jumping and I, was, I competed against you sometimes, uh, we were not allowed to use shorts. Now they're allowed to use shorts, right? I, I feel like I missed out on something because I always wanted to use shorts. How do you feel about that one? Would you, try, would you have jumped in shorts right nowadays or would you still jump in pants? No, I probably would have done the shorts as well. Yeah, that that all oh, obviously you train in shorts, and there were many times where we would train in long pants because we had to compete in long pants. So uh, training in shorts, yeah, it just makes sense that everybody can jump in shorts as long as they got good legs. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I see, me, I, I, I would, I, I would sad. never, I would never wear shorts because I have these bony knees that for sure I would get two tenths deduction on every You're single bike. Just said, as long as they got good legs, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, but see, I had I had a big butt, so the pants did not favor me in any way. So I would. I got a big butt too. It didn't work for me either. Didn't work. It was. I would have. I would have. I would have paid to use shorts, and then it was <laughs> the year that I stopped. The next year they started allowing shorts. I was. I was so disappointed. I was like, how? Why was this decision not made ten years before? Right. Like, and then, of course, so, to have shorts on, you can quickly quickly get off the trampoline. To have shorts on, you can quickly get off the trampoline and go do a double mini pass. And then move right. across to a tumbling pass. And you could have an all-around event within 10 minutes. It wouldn't be a problem right. at all. So, so the next question, and you just remind me of the third question, but the next question is, you said that you were invited for some um, double mini competitions while there was a trampoline World Cups, because at that time there was no double mini World Cups. But now there is double mini World Cups. They started last year. How would you feel if you were able to compete at a true double mini World Cup? Brilliant. I would love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. I'd even give a triple triple another crack. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Seriously. I, I, I think we would have seen brilliant things from you and Chris Mitrick nowadays at the Double Mini World Cups. Uh, I think that the level is the level increased, but you guys was so far ahead of, of everyone at, at that time for that time I, I, I I'm, I'm I'm really proud of have met you <laughs> in that moment 
Uh, well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you, Nuno. Who, who um, knows what, what would have been done with, with today's equipment and training more than three days a week on double mini, <laughs> right? I remember training those three or four days a week. It was trampoline, double mini, sink, and tumbling. You know, I used to train them all. So it was, that wasn't just three days of just trampoline. That was doing all four. Yeah. So how do you feel? We talked about this in, in, a, in a previous episode about, and we were talking about athletes now specializing, and it's very, very rare that athletes are competing um, in multiple events at the World Championships. And, and I think the last person and the only person that we know of to compete on all events is you in, in 96. And we kind of uh, started brainstorming and we thought of what if trampoline had an all around event? What, what, what do you feel? How do you feel about that? As long as I can be the first honorary all around champion. <laughs> <laughs> no, of Fair course. I mean, everybody, everybody dedicates so much time to it. Why don't we give them the opportunity to compete more? You're already at right. an event. Everything's already there set up. What would be an extra day? for the people that don't specialize in and have all the attention on a particular apparatus why don't we give these people the why don't we give these athletes the opportunity to shine in a different way because competing on all four is a skill in itself you know you I don't just so. have to be good at one event it is a tough thing that's why we have decathlon that's why we have heptathlon that's why we have right. all-around events in gymnastics it's it's a unique ability and we would want to elevate those people to shine at the same time. And it's all there. It's not like we're asking for another competition, another travel, another uh, venue, another. Yeah. We're not asking for anything other than allowing people that are already dedicating money, time and their life to it to allow them to shine. I mean, I, I, it's a no brainer, really. Yeah, I agree. So, I, so I, think I agree. I think our time is coming to an end, but I have one final question, unless Stephen has, has any more, but I have one final question. You, you are very active on our community, as we saw today uh, for, for this time. How, how do you miss it? How, how much do you miss Because we haven't seen you for a while, and I, I know I miss you, and I know I wish you would be more connected, but how is it on your side? How, how do you miss not being at competitions and, and, and not being able to see the, your international friends on a more regular basis because now being online and facebook and all social media changed the world definitely but how do you how do you feel it yeah of course i mean that if you look back everybody has segments of time in their life and no matter what i do i think for the rest of my life nothing will rise to the level of the fun and the friendships that i had and created over that time I mean, to be able to talk to you boys like it was yesterday is special and unique. And the fact that I can still call up many friends, both from Australia and all around the world. And if I happen to be in town, do you want to catch up for a coffee? Do you want to reminisce? Do you want to talk? So the friends and the experiences that I had back then will stay with me for my life. So I do miss that side of things, but of course, everything has a time and a place. Of and course. probably that's what makes it so special is that I do look back on it with such fond memories in a different place. I'm in a different place now. Everybody moves through their life at a different pace, but I'm in a different place now. And I look back at it with these great smiles on my face. It brings such a smile to my face. And only we have those stories. You know, talking to my friends now, we have our stories, but the stories that make me laugh and make me remember are the stories from trampoline. And that will stick with me forever. So, and who knows? You might see me back in the trap someday. Well, well, I'm, well I'm, FIG, FIG has this program called the Ambassadors Program. So I hope that one day they will invite you to be the ambassadors for the World Championships. I think every year they switch. So I hope that uh, one year you could be uh, one of the ambassadors. I, I, don't, I have nothing to do with it, but I, I hope they, rem they remember of, of you and they invite you. Oh, thank you very much. When, Again, nice. Thank you. When was the last time you were on a trampoline? 
Uh, and so flipped. For, quite, for about five years, once I got back to Australia, I was just doing some work at a trampoline park and it was purely social, purely making sure the kids were having a good time. And of course, every now and again, they'd say, get on the trampoline and do something. So I'd show them a Guarani and they used to go, oh, my <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I used to say to them, that's nothing, kid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jai, we appreciate your time here with us. Um, I know we have some younger listeners, so uh, I'm really excited that some of them get to learn about you and that you pioneered the sport, um, you know, in, in the world and in Australia and that um, you know, you're truly something special in our sport. And thank you for sharing all of your insight and your stories. And I had a really great time. And I hope we can do it again. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Boisa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jai. Jump low, jump high. Thank you. That concludes our conversation with Olympic silver medalist Jai Wallace. There will be no Q and A today, but on the next episode. Nuno and I will be recording episode 10 live and solely dedicated to answering questions that we have received. You can also text in questions live for us to answer during the podcast. Until then, send us questions, comments, or opinions by emailing us at trampolineinsight at gmail.com, on Twitter at trampinsight, or on Instagram at trampolineinsight. You can also send us a voice message with questions or opinions by following the link in the episode description so we can play it on the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we can't wait to see you guys live on the next episode. See you guys.